Hey everybody, how are you? It's 3 p.m. here in New York City on a very sweltering afternoon. It's well over 90 degrees all of a sudden out of nowhere. This is the, <laughs> if there's ever been any evidence of climate change, I would say the fact that we really don't have any spring anymore would be the telling indication. I mean, basically, it starts to rain for about two to three weeks and it's very overcast and it gets cold and damp. And then one day the sun is blazing away and it's summer and today would be that day, but who knows. So, uh, well, thank you for joining me. I'm in the solo acoustic mode. I couldn't really uh, do the window setup, unfortunately, because the sun is so strong right there uh, in that part of the sky at this part of the afternoon that uh, it's just, it's fatiguing to tell you the truth. And uh, I don't, I need to see what I'm doing. Otherwise I'll be blinded by the light as Bruce Springsteen would say. And anyway, so here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, that song I've been working on with the electric guitar called Unforgiven, I would have liked to have played it for you, but I have to leave today at uh, the very end of this, about 3.30, to get over to a studio where I'm working on a secret, <laughs> yeah, so secret, uh, this project that uh, I can't really discuss it, I don't want to jinx it but I'm adding some electric guitar parts. So I had to dismantle that setup in preparation for a quick departure so I can get there by four o'clock today. As it's so hot, who knows what the uh, traffic patterns are gonna be like, and I'm certainly not gonna walk over there uh, in this heat. Oh, but a good name for a band, I always thought. Now there was a great English band of that same name, This Heat. So, uh, all right, so I'm doing acoustic, but I had a lot of requests for acoustic from you guys. And
you can hear uh, Lulu acting up out there because it could be someone is prowling the corridor. Could be a maintenance guy in our building, but it could be Caroline too because she had to go out to get some <laughs> medicine for Lulu. I don't know, but Lulu is Lulu has been uh, genetically bred to repel intruders. If you know your Schnauzer mythology, Schnauzers were raised to be basically ratter dogs, to to chase and eliminate rats in the Middle Ages, in the plague years. Now we're coming out of this plague year. I stopped calling this a journal of the plague year so as to uh, <laughs> quicken the recovery period, at least, uh, you know, if I had anything to do with willing it to, to cease this COVID epidemic, I would do so. So I thought, okay, well, we'll take that out of the title of these shows. But in any case, uh, Schnauzers were coach dogs. Uh, they were bred to, to perch in stagecoaches next to their owners uh, in case also of bandits who might waylay the coach on the road, then they would go into full-on attack mode. And if you ever saw Lulu, uh, if we had a guest over here, she's really odd this way because she's naturally suspicious of people she doesn't know coming into the apartment and gets very barky for this little thing that she is. I mean, she's probably the loudest dog in the world. And uh, then she calms down and kind of makes peace with these folks if they're sitting down. But the minute they stand up to uh, leave or to stretch their legs or to move to any other position in our apartment, she immediately thinks there's a monster that's manifested in front of her and she will lunge at, uh, at various pant legs. And uh, she's had some success nipping through uh, one or two of them. Uh, not enough to do any harm. I don't think she actually pricked any skin there with her teeth. But, you know, to the person it's being done to, it could be, I'm sure, a terrifying experience. But essentially, she was a love bucket. And uh, they haven't yet been able to, uh, to separate her from us because they did try a couple of times. I might have referred to uh, my lovely neighbors on either side of this apartment. Oh, I think it was about eight years ago. I'll just recall it briefly for you. But I was in Cuba working, and I got a call. Uh, no, it must have been an email, but yes, because the phone didn't work down there. And But it was Caroline saying, you have to come home as soon as possible because uh, we had been served a notice through our co-op board that if Lulu's barking continued... And this was driven by complaints from the neighbors on both sides of us. Uh, if her barking continued, we didn't do anything about it. We risked eviction from this domicile, which is patently illegal, I have to tell you, in checking it out with a lawyer that we hired who was a well-known real estate attorney. And actually, the, uh, the criterion for there being an actionable offense vis-a-vis -a, -vis a dog in an apartment in New York City is that the dog has to manifest 10 minutes of sustained continuous barking after 11 p.m. And uh, she never ever has done that and never will. I mean, she emits occasionally a loud bark after 11, but it's pretty, it's nothing sustained. Uh, it's not that bad. And usually, you know, is, is asleep shortly thereafter. But we had to go, first of all, we got a nanny cam, basically a little camera set up. Uh, and, you know, it ran with cartridges so you could record hours at a time. And we set it up trained on her little sleep pad over in the corner. And we turned it on, we left the apartment because part of the complaint also said uh, that Lulu barked continuously during the day when we weren't in the apartment, which was also patently untrue. And anyway, so we had hours and hours of footage where we'd go, okay, bye, Lulu, bye, Lulu. And then we'd leave the apartment and she would pad over, and this was substantiated by the, the, the nanny cam. She'd pad over to the pad and plop down and fall asleep, and there was no sustained barking. 
So in our defense, we marshaled all this evidence and told the management board about this, and they rescinded the threat of eviction. However, a charge of a couple grand remain, was added to our maintenance bill to cover the cost of the cardboard having to hire an attorney to write this threatening eviction notice in the first place, go figure. So on the advice of our attorney, he said, well, don't pay it. And he wrote a letter to the person who sent it and said, show us where that's legal, it's not. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Eventually, it stayed on there for the last seven or eight years, and then last year it was finally taken off with some sleight of hand by the management company to <laughs> to claim there were some late fees due. And anyway, so it was disappeared into that, and it was fine with us. I mean, we just got it off off the bill and off our chest. So now everybody's friends here <laughs> until the neighbors next door on this side come back which maybe they will any day now. And then there'll be a war of stares at the door about our hideous barking dog. But what are you gonna do, folks? This is New York City, this is not the sticks. And there's all sorts of gross intrusions of noise and the latest being a, a gross intrusion of stench. I wanna just uh, mention this. I don't think this is gonna be propelled into any action by anybody, but we'll see. Cause I've written a letter, but I mean, as of about two weeks ago, a toxic, a horrible, gluey, disgusting stench was suddenly uh, manifest when you got to the corner of Greenwich Street and Charles Street for pretty much the whole length of the street going down to Christopher and up to Bank Street, if you know the West Village. Uh, just disgusting. And I could not pinpoint it. I wasn't really sure what was driving it. I mentioned it to a few people who denied noticing it, but then one of them said, oh yeah, uh, I went out there with <laughs> my dog at midnight, it's there. So uh, then someone else said, well, it's this green painted bike lane that the city came in and like, a th like thieves in the night, or should I say assailants in the night, painted this toxic green. I don't know what the compound paint is, but it's hideous and it stinks and it's not going away. So today we were out uh, shopping at the green market in Abingdon Square, getting some delicious scallops, fresh and veggies. Good stuff for <laughs> Caroline to prepare tonight after I come home from a hard day in the studio. And uh, we met, I, the smell was even there, although it's sort of off of Hudson Street. And I mentioned that an, a woman, an, an English woman turned and said, you smell it too, it's insane, it's terrible. I've complained about it. And so, but like, what do you think the people who are operating these I guess they're not fugitive cafes anymore. They're here to stay. These lean-to shelter alfresco dining uh, establishments that have like cropped up since the pandemic began. I don't know about your cities, if you're in uh, the U.S. or in Europe or anything, but this was this was a solution that the city came up to in a way to keep a lot of dining establishments open. Uh, if you you know, whereas you couldn't go in to dine the old way anymore. Now now they're allowing it to a limited degree. But uh, it was hailed, you know, as a great innovation and how European this was. And we're going to keep it all year round, and that maybe they will, which is good. I mean, I like eating outdoors too. But uh, there's a whole bunch of them abutting this green stripe on the west side of Hudson Street that runs up and down Hudson that stinks, literally. That's just, I can't go out there. And I, I you know, it's not that I'm like necessarily so, so sensitive, but I don't think it's healthy. It seems toxic. I mean, the fumes to me seem really industrially toxic. I do not know why the city chose to paint using this particular medium. Uh, and then I did a little research today and it turns out they put in these green bike lanes in the East Village 
two years ago in 2018, and there's a whole slew of complaints online for the same toxic stench. So I don't think anybody ever reached the people making decision. I don't know if it's City Hall, but it is the city who mandates, you know, this kind of like a improvement to the infrastructure. You know, we've got to make sure that those bike lanes are safe. I mean, not to mention, most people who go whizzing by in the wrong direction on their bikes, willy-nilly in New York City, nobody does anything about it. There have been people who've been crippled from, like, delivery guys going the wrong way on a one-way street, and bam, you know, they get slammed into their spines, and that, that is that. So uh, they should look into this. That's all. I'm just saying. So that's my rant. For now, I must be heat mad. Okay, I'm gonna put this in drop D tuning. One of my old reliables. You know, it could be the holiest of all tunings. Now, I'm just paraphrasing Spinal Tap. The most mystical of all the keys. If you believe in a Scriabin-esque attribution of like definitely mystical powers to, to colors. Music has all sorts of them. I think Hugh Pato's Loud Green Song, that would be appropriate right now for this, this uh, striped green toxic. <laughs> this acoustic. Let's get this precisely in tune. And uh, soon I'm going to take a pay a visit to Carmine Street Guitars and see old Rick Kelly for a tune-up. Anyway, or something. Linseed oil on the fretboard. Yeah, I got it.
I love that chord. <laughs> Isn't it a beautiful dissonance? Anyway, uh, I have to scoot out of here. I've enjoyed playing for you today. It keeps me on my toes. I haven't really played acoustic in a long time. I'm so into working on that other piece. I can't wait to play these new parts. But it's going to have to wait a little bit because I know Monday and Tuesday, Caroline has a marathon Zoom sessions, I think, from some t something like 9 to 5 on Monday and then something like noon to 6 on Tuesday. So I'm, pr I'm probably going to be here at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Tuesday, which would be... Gee, um, after midnight, 1 a.m. In, in the UK, I believe you have the same time now as the rest of Western Europe. I gotta check that, but probably, yeah, uh, let's see, yeah, six hours ahead. So uh, I hope you can stay up that late, because I love playing for you. And then Pippa Casey down there in uh, Down Under, I don't know what time that's gonna be, but I hope you can make it to all you nice people. And let's see how that goes. And uh, until such time, I hope you have a great rest of the weekend. I hope it's not so sweltering wherever you are. I admit it's a little bit better than the ice and cold, but not that much. I think I prefer ice and cold. Uh, but, you know, that's me, and that's because I, I came from such a climate there in upstate New York, in the snow belt of New York State. So I was just used to it. It's a little bit more of a realistic kind of climate, is it not? And uh, I can't wait to play this new project. Maybe we'll leak a track soon once it's all mixed. But uh, anyway, enjoy playing for you. Please visit my virtual tip jar. It misses you. <laughs> it's like calling out for you there. Uh, it would be so appreciated. And uh, until then... I'll just sign off here. Thanks a lot for for uh, everything. And uh, let's see, we get the 360 degree vertigo panoramic shot here. I don't have a dolly, I'm doing it all by my lonesome. Okay, let's take a look at the window, can you see? Nah, it's too bright. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> thanks again. Love you guys, see you soon.